The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of any major corporation whatsoever. Blood-sucking freaks, a touching World War II romantic period piece drama. Oh my god. Dame Judi Dench is amazing in this. Yes. Amazing in this. I I I had tears. Yes. Through a I... huge portion of this film. It, it, it was very touching. It was very, very gripping. Um, some of the performances were, were just excellent. Um, yeah. You know, you can see why Dame Judi Dench got the Oscar. She just leaves it all there on the screen. Mm-hmm. Yes, she can. Yeah. Yes, she absolutely can. Absolutely amazing. Oh, my God. As Zar- as as Sardu... Roddy McDowell was amazing. <laughs> oh my God, he was just incredible. Roddy McDowell was just one of those actors who just never lets you down. Never lets you down. Yeah. Never lets you down. Uh, Roddy McDowell also appeared in Caligula. And here's an interesting fact about Caligula there are currently 38 different cuts of the film. Really? Okay. No. Actually, since I said the number 38, there are now 46. (laughs) Okay. That's how many different cuts of the film there are. Oh, wait. And let me look it up. Yeah, now there's 84. Uh There's 84 different cuts of Caligula out there. So you got to be careful which one you get. Um, I'm pretty sure I originally had the long, boring version. (laughs) Nice. So... This week, we're discussing Bloodsucking Freaks, or as it's known in Spanish, El Bloodsucking Freaks. I don't know Spanish, and if you thought I did, then you're so racist. <laughs> so, okay. This week, we are discussing the 70s gore exploitation movie, Bloodsucking Freaks, a.k.a. Sardu, Master of the Screaming Virgins, yes. a.k.a. The Incredible Torture Show, a.k.a. Kind of Crap. (laughs) (laughs) To be clear, I didn't even realize this, but originally the film was called The Incredible Torture Show, specifically because it spelled out tits. Really? Nice. That's the level of uh, uh, high-quality drama that you're getting from this film. Yes. So yes. the internet, but you've got, but you've got to admit that there, there really are not many movies like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are, there are also not, not a lot of you. You, you can say the same thing about divine eating shit. Yes, exactly, exactly. That doesn't mean you know, I want to watch it all the time, but <laughs> yeah, no, I'll, I'll give it a, I'll, I'll give it a muffin basket. I'll give it a trophy. Yes, because the way I see it is, I see these two DVDs next to each other, and then one of them is blood sucking freaks, mm-hmm. and blood sucking freaks says, "They never told you what happened to your father." And the other DVD, which is Saw, yeah. says, they told me enough. They told me you killed him. And Bloodsucking Freaks goes, no, I am your father. <laughs> because they, they, like, I was trying to think of the context of this film. Because mm-hmm. I saw this film at the wrong time. Because I've seen Hostel, and I've seen Hostel 2, yeah. and I've seen every Saw, and I've seen all these, like, uh, do what they call torture porn movies. Yeah. So now watching this movie, I'm like, oh, how quaint. I'm sure this was shocking in 1970, whatever the fuck, but this is doing nothing for me. Which is, well, that is also part of the charm I feel about it. Yeah. There you was know? a part of me that felt like, okay, if I had seen this when I was 14, this would have fucked me up and would have changed my life. But seeing this now, yeah. like, I'm not even sure if I've seen this film or not. Like, I may have seen this before, but I don't know. Like, there are some parts that seemed familiar and some parts that didn't. So I'm not even sure if I've seen this before. But yeah. but I feel that just watching it now, it was just the wrong time. But, but, but really... He, 
like the the movie that came to my mind was Blood Feast. That was a great Blood episode. Feast. Yes. I love that fucking movie, but still there's a quaintness to Blood Feast because that was the first film to feature gore. Whereas this film, Blood Sucking Freaks, is the first film to get gore and say, okay, now let's porn this. Yes. Mm-hmm. Let's porn the gore. Well, this is and- also one of those movies that I was talking about. Like, like, okay, at, at any second, this can turn into a snuff film. Mm-hmm. At any yeah. second. It, it, uh, you wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. You wouldn't be surprised, like, but I, I, I find, I find a lot of strange charm in this movie. If you, yeah. if you take it from the perspective of, well, this is just an over the top Adams family, really. Yeah. You know, that's, like I, like I have 100 pre- one here's one good thing I'll say from this week's torture porn film. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty convinced that Dreamworks based their minions on this little afro guy. <laughs> that was the thing that struck me the most is that throughout this entire film the midget in this film yeah. is wearing a yellow shirt with overalls dancing around like a hyperactive monster. Mm-hmm. All I could see was a minion. Nice. I like it. I mean, literally, he's just like a 70s Afro minion dancing around throughout this entire film, uh, getting uh, oral from a, from a, from a, a severed head. Severed head. Yeah. Thank you. I got the word severed. But yeah. Yeah, basically the main And Al Snow ripped this. that off. Oh hell yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. I miss Al Snow. <laughs> I bought a I, I specifically bought a Mick Foley wrestling DVD only because I heard that hidden on the DVD was a secret match. Uh a secret match which was actually not even one of Mick Foley's matches, he Mick Foley hid on his DVD Al Snow's worst match, <laughs> which he and one of the other wrestling commentators make fun of. They added new commentary to this horrible match. Nice, <laughs> and it was it was the kennel in a cell match. Okay. And it was a hell in the cell, except between the ring and the hell in the cell were supposed to be like 30 rabid dogs. But of course they weren't rabid, and one of them like pisses and shits in the middle of the match, and it's just... <laughs> it's, a, it's a horrible match, but it's so great to see, uh, to hear Mick Foley basically mystery science theatering a wrestling match. Yeah. And there was a part of me that was like, why can't just why can't you just do that? Why can't you just release like a, a, a DVD where famous wrestlers riff their favorite worst matches? Yeah. That's amazing. I'd buy the shit out of that. I'd buy that <laughs> twice. Anyway. But it is um, funnier coming from Mick Foley. Yeah. It's yeah. a it's a big just kind of fuck you. <laughs> yeah. So, blood sucking freaks. The internet, home of memes. Yes. The internet says that blood sucking freaks is a spoof of grindhouse gore films. But isn't that just what you call a no a no budget gore movie in the seventies? Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I I think it's really giving the film too much credit to say that this film is a tongue in cheek spoof of gore films. No. No, but, but okay. I, I think that's going way too far. I understand where they're going. Okay. But they're going way too far of this, but it definitely is a parody of Herschel Gordon Lewis's work. Oh yeah. Yeah. I feel that this movie is basically just, um, some no budget filmmakers saw the wizard of gore and said, and said, what if we make the movie he wanted to? 
Yes, yes. And there's and there is the big weird comparison that you can make to the Wizard of Gore, uh, which Sardu does in the opening of the film, where he yep. he first tells you that none of this is real. Well, he tortures a girl. And then he tells you none of this is real. It's all theater and all that. Until somebody in the audience says, it's a trick. Oh, yeah, motherfucker? Let me show you how real it is now. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, like, what? Like, you're bad at this. Yeah. You are really bad at this. And Wizard of Gore, uh, uh, this is like one of the reasons why I really hated the Wizard of Gore. Yeah. Because it had that, sh- that same strange opening contrived weirdness where he the wizard of gore was not killing the girl but the entire audience was hypnotized so that they see him killing the girl and then he kills the girl which was like yeah wait what what? I would one day like I I would one day like to get my hands on the remake they did with Crispin Glover. I've seen it once. It's really good. I really yeah. like it. Yeah, I really want to get my hands on that, or maybe like do in one episode do both of them side by side as a sort of comparison. Like that would be fun. Yeah, like the way that eventually we should do Willard. Yes, which we've, we we would talked about before. Mm-hmm. But anyway. Blood sucking freaks made in 1976. It got a bit of a name for itself in cult movie circles on account of the gore. Yeah. I've never seen it or maybe I have. It's a wee bit forgettable in its over the topness. Basically, this is the great grandfather of torture porn. Well, I really think that this, this, this is a movie that was kind of saved by the videotape industry. Oh, hell yeah. Because it was oh, one yeah. of the early videotapes to have come out. You know, yeah. Blood Sucking Freaks. This, I Dismember yeah, Mama. Driller Killer. Driller yeah. Killer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The Toolbox Murders. Yeah. Yeah. Films like that, that if VHS hadn't come around, like no one would remember these things. Yes. I feel that a lot of these movies were created not to be remembered. We had talked about that a couple of episodes before mm-hmm. with um, the the horror on Party Beach. Yeah. And no one made that film thinking 55 years from now, this film will be talked about by a stoned man and a long haired <laughs> Mexican. This film will be remembered forever. No, no one makes blood sucking freaks thinking this will be historic this blood sucking freaks reminds me of um children shouldn't play with dead things in regard to it looks a lot like there actually was an off broadway troupe of actors who said hey let's let's throw together a movie and that's what they did yeah. they threw together a movie So, if you want to know just what kind of movie this is, all you need to know is this film was picked up and distributed by Troma Pictures. Yes. Sorry, Mr. Lobo. Troma Pictures, home of crap. (laughs) I'm not a fan... Of trauma pictures. I not a big fan of Lloyd Kaufman. Not a fan of Tromeo and Juliet. Uh, the 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 Toxic Avenger. Not a fan. I, not because I was scarred as a child, but just because it's just not my thing. Yeah. I am a fan of a, a few trauma movies. And then there, there are some that are just horrible and unwatchable, you know, but some of them, some of them I, I enjoy. I enjoy the Toxic Avenger. I enjoy Class of Newcomb High. Uh, I do like Tromeo and Juliet. 
There's um, only one. There's only one Trauma Pictures movie that I, I like, and it's called Blades. Yeah, and it's it's about a lawnmower at a golf course that goes insane, goes insane, and starts killing people. Nice. The great thing about it, the great thing about the movie though is that it's essentially Jaws on a golf course. Yeah. And it's so ridiculous, but literally, they just remade Jaws on a golf course with a <laughs> lawnmower. And it's so ridiculous, but it, it, it's not as gory as your typical trauma film. They yeah. were literally just let parody Jaws, but on a golf course, this will be ridiculous. Well, once you and read. And nobody wanted it, so it was just picked up by trauma because that's just what happens. Once you read one of Lloyd Kaufman's books or uh, watch a trauma. A, a, a trauma documentary, which is at least one out, um, for all the gore. Now all I can see is watermelons. Yeah, because he <laughs> predominantly used watermelons. Yeah, for head crushing and stuff like that. And it's like that's awesome. I love that idea, but I, I don't know Lloyd Kaufman. I kind of look. Lloyd Kaufman gets a certain amount of points from me for looking and acting so similar to Mel Brooks. Yeah. You know? So I give him a few extra you points know? for that. But I, I I have heard really shitty, shitty stories about Lloyd Kaufman. Yeah. And just really I, fucking I... people. I like Lloyd Lloyd Kaufman, but only because I can't hate anyone who was in Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, mm-hmm. that gives it's him just some cred. Yeah, <laughs> love that movie. Can't hate anyone who has been in it. Yeah. So Troma is the home of low budget gore and sex, and somehow the former home of James Gunn. Yeah. Again, how does someone escape Troma? It's it's beyond us. But well, he's the only one who managed so far. Yeah, yeah, he's the only one who has managed to escape, and he's the name who keeps appearing in things like this. It's kind of like I'm I'm living in Shawnee, Oklahoma, and Shawnee, Oklahoma, um, is the birthplace of Brad Pitt. And you know who else is from here? Who? No one. Uh huh. No one. No one but Brad Pitt. <laughs> and you can tell you can tell that Brad Pitt is from here because he would never be caught dead here. <laughs> That's how you can tell he's really was born here and went to school here and lived here. Because there's no way his ass is ever coming back here. That's one of the reasons why I liked the nineties alternative band Cake. Okay. Because Cake they had they had the song uh, 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 He's Going the Distance and they did a cover of I Will Survive and and it, they were a really good alternative band in the 90s and they were from Sacramento, California and the way you can tell that they were from Sacramento, California is that they've had a career that has spanned decades and they've never played Sacramento, California. <laughs> nice. They've played every city around Sacramento, California, but they're so successful that there's no way they're ever setting foot in their hometown again. <laughs> like, good for you. Yeah. That's Brad Pitt, and that's James Gunn and Trauma. <laughs> like, he's not good. Yeah. He's from Trauma, and you can tell because he's never going back to Trauma. This is one of those films, and I I, I, I I tried really hard to explain this, but uh, Blood Sucking Freaks is one of those films that's so bloody and so gory yeah. and so full of nastiness that it's almost uncriticizable. <laughs> uncriticizable. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? I'm, like, I'm not like, sure if that makes sense yet. Like, oh, this film has too much gore, and that's bad. Okay, well, what if we put a massive, crazy, insane amount of gore, so much so 
that it's so ridiculous and over the top that, uh, yeah, good luck trying to uh, bring us down. Yeah. Good, good luck trying to shoot us down. What part? Oh, what part was too much for you? The part where the sick, sadistic midget was getting oral sex from a decomposed head. Oh, was that too much for you? <laughs> you know, like like they go so far. Yeah. That you, that that like there's no way for you to like criticize. Oh well, this was this was too much. Well, it's also hard not to appreciate the balls of a movie like this. Yes. Yes. You know, they they were like, yeah, we're not getting a rating. We're not, you know, we're lucky if we finish this fucking movie, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So so I appreciate the -the over-the-topness of it. Um, There are a few things I appreciate about this movie. But, But as far as going back to trauma for a minute, I mean, it's a, it's it's put out by trauma, but it's one of those movies that's like not really a trauma film. Yeah, it's one of those films that trauma picked up, but it's not a trauma movie. Yeah, it's a horror movie. They could pick it up on the cheap, so they put it in their catalog like that and Mother's Day and a few other movies that were put out independently and then just grabbed by trauma. Yeah. So... Oh, freaking blood sucking freaks! Horror fans love this freaking movie. Yes, that's one thing I learned uh, scouring the internet trying to find information about blood sucking freaks. This is Citizen Kane to some fucking people. I definitely wouldn't go that far. Oh, but I would. <laughs> The, the 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 problem that I had with the film comes from the fact that that it it just seems sleazy. A lot of the actors and the behind the scenes people, cameraman and that, just w- were literally, you know, we have no budget. How do we make this film? So they just picked a bunch of actors and and, and cameramen and whatever from seventies porn, and yeah. it just shows. It does. It does. It like, definitely has a porn court, feel. Herschel Gordon Lewis had a bit more professionalism to it, whereas this just feels skeezy. Oh, I I think I would disagree. A lot of Herschel Gordon Lewis's movies felt skeezy to me. I know, but the only ones that I know are the Wizard of... The only ones that I've seen are the Wizard of Gordon Blood Feast. I haven't gone... Oh, and uh, what's that other one we did? The 2000 Maniacs. I haven't gone far beyond that. Yeah. So my my knowledge of his, his films are fairly limited. Uh, Blood Feast is v- bloody and violent and also fairly professional. You know? Like, it, it's still, it still felt like, like, like an old school movie, but an old school movie that featured gore. Yeah, maybe I can give you that. I just love... Yeah. I, I, I love the scene at the end where, like, they're chasing this man, and this man hides in in a, a trash compactor. But the trash compactor closes in on him, and suddenly he's compacted, and there's blood everywhere, and there's guts. And the cops are like, "Well, let's take this time to calmly explain exactly what happened in this film." <laughs> mm-hmm. So you remember earlier when I said this. It's like, dude, there's a dead, bloody corpse in front of you. Why are you stopping to exposition shit? Yes. <laughs> like, oh, no, that, that would never happen in this freaking film. Yeah. This film just seems skeezier. There's torture and boobs and hairy vajayjays and... And, uh, yeah, like, at any second a porn could break out in this film i felt yeah Uh uh-huh yeah yeah well that's uh, again that's again that's kind of that's kind of the charm to it yeah at least for the first time watch the kind of charm because like anything can happen in this movie yeah you know anything can anything can happen with this movie you know there was not an adult overseeing this oh oh yeah oh yeah you know, and, and and speaking of porn, I think I picked this up on some website, but I don't remember 
Um, porn movies have hardly any plot, especially in the seventies, because there 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 were plots back then. Yeah. A instead of a YouTube like series of various people banging. But back in the day, there would be plots, and the plots would be ridiculous and nonsensical and very threadbare, because the plot was literally just getting you from point A to point B. And both point A and point B were people fucking, and those were the the things that you paid to see. Mm -hmm. So the plot was just the smallest excuse to get you from point A to point B. And I felt that, that this is literally the birth of torture porn. Because if you paid to go see this movie in a theater, and really, if you pay attention, if you really close your eyes and and pay attention, you can smell the theater that this movie was shown in. Yes, you can. Oh, God, yes, you totally can. Oh, my God, I can can. smell the theater that this played in on 42nd Street. Exactly, and I I probably would have gone into that theater on 42nd Street and watched it. I watched the... I watched... I watched a lot of porn on 42nd Street. My 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 favorite porn experience in New York on 42nd Street. I I had gone into the city alone just to blow off steam and things like that and while I was masturbating in the theater a huge rat walked down the aisle. Oh, okay. And I was like this is just this is it. This is the pinnacle of this experience. And I don't think I went back to a porn theater ever. Not because, not because I was scared of rats or anything, but it's like, that's the best you could do. That was the best porn experience I felt I was ever going to have. Yeah. So I was just done. Oh, when I first moved to, uh, to uh, California, to Sacramento, there was a porn theater there, and I thought that was quaint because it's like what two thousand four. Yeah, and there's a porn theater here. Like I didn't think those really existed, and it wasn't like a porn store that had a tiny theater in the back. No, it was a porn theater. <laughs> And I was like, that's interesting. Like, this is like a really a bygone. This is almost kind of historical. Well, yeah. goddamn, I'm a I'm a amateur film historian. I have to go to this porn theater. Mm-hmm. So I went into the porn theater and there was a tiny store slash gift shop. But really, the whole thing was just literally they just got a theater, an actual movie theater. And showed porn in it, and the lobby they turned into a tiny little sex store. Yeah, but really, it was a theater, and there was this big screen, and and they, you know, they would show one porn film on one side of the screen, yeah, and the other porn film on the other side of the screen. And I went <coughs> in the lobby, and I looked around, and I went to go buy a ticket, and I noticed that they sold popcorn. Yeah, don't get the popcorn. And I stopped, and I'm like. You sell popcorn at the porn theater. When people go in to see a porn at this theater, are they going snacks? <laughs> and the person and the person who was working there was kind of like the eyebrows raised up because obviously, you know, their conversation with customers never go this deep. Yeah. And so they're like, yeah, no. We sell a lot of popcorn, but mostly it's just so that people can cut a hole in it. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, so you sell tickets to a porn theater and sell dick flavored popcorn. And the guy said, well, to be fair, it's not dick flavored when you buy it. It's just popcorn. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, fair enough. I'll give you that one ticket to the porn, please. Mm hmm. So. So I went into this porn theater and I sit down and immediately after sitting down, suddenly I'm surrounded by five guys. Yeah. And they all have the dicks out and I'm like, oh, that, that's interesting. I'm going to try <laughs> and watch this movie. And one guy comes up to my ear and goes, do you want me to suck your cock? But me being a young 20 something guy, I go, oh, no, thanks. I'm good. 
Like, okay, in retrospect, maybe you shouldn't have been that nice about it, Steve. Yeah. Because <laughs> this guy has no idea what the fuck to do. Like, this is a porn theater. You're not expecting that level of niceness and customer service. Yes. So the guy's like, what the fuck? And he walks away. And then he comes back and goes, I'll give you 20 bucks if you let me suck my cock. And then I go, um, no thanks. I'm still good. Thank you, though. Like, like I'm at a restaurant and someone asks me for more water. Yes. Is apparently how I treated that. <laughs> Like, like I'm at a nice restaurant, and then someone says, would you like lemon with that water? My reaction to that is the same way I, react, I reacted to some strange guy asking to suck my dick. Yeah. <laughs> I was blown away. In retrospect, I'm blown away by that. Yeah. At least that shows that I'm really good at customer service. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. You know, you can handle people. Yeah. Even even when I'm in a skeezy porn theater, I'm thinking of people first. I I I I would consider that a very good, good porn experience. And and if I were you, that's where I would stop going to porn theaters. I, I would be like, this is perfect. This is just this is the pinnacle of this experience. No no experience. I, I, I'm. Yeah. Done with porn theaters now. Yeah, it's and a, that was the last porn theater I went to. It, like, like when I went to the back to my car, mm -hmm. the guy followed me to my car and said, "Hey, man, how come you don't want to get your dick sucked?" And I'm like, "I'm just not into it. Thank you, though." <laughs> and the guy just turned, and the guy turned around, cussing my name. As loud as he fucking could. Like he didn't know my name, but he's just he just turned around, motherfucking son of a bitch. And I'm like, gee, what's wrong with that fellow? <laughs> you'd think you'd meet a nicer, a nicer uh, a type of fellow at one of these adult theaters. Yes. Uh -huh. Gee, what's wrong with people nowadays? You took the adventure. And you came out the other side with a good story. That's all we can yeah, ask I out did. of life. Yeah, I did. I got a good story out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, if anything, I'm surprised by my my reaction in the face of extreme situations, where it's where whether it's getting into a robbery at work or some strange, creepy dude following me to my car trying to suck me off. <laughs> I'm still calm. Yes. So that's good. Mm -hmm. So I know that I, I'm, you know, I've been tested, and yes, I, I passed. So that's good. But but this really is this film really is the birth of torch porn because literally the filmmakers are are saying to themselves the only reason that anyone would pay money to see this film is to see naked women getting tortured. So whatever the plot is has to be as thin as possible so we can get from torture scene A to torture scene B. Yes. Basically, that's exactly the same as porn, but with torture, this is the birth of torture porn. So, uh, uh, regardless... You, okay, okay, my, you sold that, yeah. Yeah, so mm -hmm. regardless of my feelings towards this film, this is an historic film. Torture porn is a huge fucking thing. They're bringing back the Saw movies! Yeah, I saw that. For shit's sake. They made like seven of those. They made a shit ton every time they came out. Two or three of them had Luke Danes in it, for shit's sake. <laughs> and now the the Saw movies are coming back. And so, so yeah, no, this is an, an historic fucking thing. Yes. This is really the first torture porn. Literally, because it was filled with porn actors. And it was the first real torture movie. But the, there, I have a plot synopsis. It's surprisingly detailed, but not okay. the most detailed plot synopsis because uh, it's it, this is torture porn. It, there's, there's, it's the torture that is the important thing, not the freaking plot. There's not a there's not a plot to synopse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But before we, or get at least to plot not synopsis, much of one. 
Yeah. Before we get to the plot synopsis, I really need to be. So maybe okay. we should take a break. Should we take a break? We should take a break. We should take a break. We will be right back with more of Torture Porn after these commercial messages. Do, 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 do. Really need to be. Do, 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 do. Godzilla to fight our Monster Zero. Earth answered, and the most dreaded creatures ever to walk our planet are lifted into outer space. The stage is set for the mightiest battle ever seen by the universe in Monster Zero. back with more of the Pokemon film. So before we break down the plot of this week's movie, I wanted to have a little aside here. Um, so I've been trying to work on my editing skills. So I've been trying to make these tiny little movies. I did this thing called Mondo Galindo where I combine some of my fame my favorite tiny movie scenes with old movie previews and it, i i made a video and it's two hours and six minutes cool two hours and seven minutes and it's the best mystery science theater shorts it's over two hours of mystery science theater shorts yeah and I published it in October of 2016, so a year ago. And and I thought, oh, you know, this is just me working on my editing skills and it's Mystery Science Theater shorts. I posted it on YouTube and I thought, oh, this will be fun. You know, yeah, this will be just a fun thing to have. And apparently between last year and this year new mystery science theaters came out. And I think that that was a big help because as of right now, this video of mine has been seen 10,153 times. Nice. Yeah. And a bunch of people are, are commenting and stuff. Oh, props to the person who put this together. Uh, apparently there's a video on of, about Puerto Rico. I put in there. Yeah. And someone commented a best of compilation without Mr. B natural. Really? So I commented <laughs> like, yes, I didn't mention, I didn't put Mr. B natural, but, um, that's like 25 minutes long by not including it. I could fit in like three more videos. Yeah. It's called an executive decision. Yes, exactly. You know, and, and I wanted more videos. That's a long ass video. It is the best, but God damn it. I, I fit in so many more videos just by removing it. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. If you want to see over two hours of mystery science theater shorts, check me out on, on uh YouTube. Yes. <laughs> so let's discuss the plot of blood sucking freaks. The film opens up really simply with the main character, Pony Boy coming out of a Steve McQueen film. Yes. And he's immediately jumped by a group of socias. Yes. Oh, how I hate those socias. <laughs> always, always making life harder for us greasers. 
characters. Mm -hmm. And you don't know this yet in the film, but Pony Boy is gold. Yeah. And other people hopes that he stays that way. Yeah. We have Spoiler gotten. alert. Sorry. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Pony Boy is gold. <laughs> so as the film opens up, two creepy guys are driving yeah. to deliver a crate to a midget and a bad stage magician. And I call that a Richard Simmons spotting. Okay. Yes. 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 The two creepy guys specifically are Telly Savalas and Kyle Mooney from the last 10 minutes of every SNL. <laughs> but you don't see them ever again, so it doesn't matter. Amber, will you do me a favor and get me a beer, please? I love you. You're amazing. I like your hair. So, and right, and right there is is like classic low budget crap movie where they have to show you painful details that you do not need. Yeah, yeah. we did not need yeah. to see them unload this box and carry it. Yeah. Yeah, no, you didn't need that. No, nope. but um, again, the midget is dressed like a minion. Yes, literally dressed like a minion. He has a yellow shirt. He has overalls. He is a minion. Mm -hmm. This midget was the first minion. <laughs> I swear to God, it 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 would not be surprising if like the. The foreign people, if the French people who were responsible with making Despicable Me said, you know who we should base the minions on? You remember that midget who was from Bloodsucking Freaks? <laughs> that should be the minions of this movie. Yes. And all the, all the people at DreamWorks said, yes, go with it. No one will ever make this connection. <laughs> so we're in the clear no one would ever be crazy enough to link despicable me to blood sucking freaks we're in the clear go with it but we at the pope on film have uncovered this breaking story uh -huh. we are on to first. your little games we are the first uh -huh. so in the crate are women who are being s delivered to Sardu, the itchy sweatered actor. Yes. Who runs a low rent theater of the macabre where everything is on everything on stage, all the murders that happen on stage are fake, but shocker, it's all totally real. Yeah. It's the wizard of core, but with less panache. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, what do I know? So Sardu is doing the show and he's, oh, this is all fake. All for your amusement. Don't think that this is real because it's not. It's totally fake. You see this woman that died? She totally didn't. This is all acting. I love Sardu. I yeah, love no, Sardu. He is such a he is such a pretentious creep. He reminded me and I couldn't think of the name and I was going to look it up, but I didn't want to because I didn't want to spend a lot of time on this. Yeah. But he reminded me of that guy who's both from Benson and Deep Space Nine. Yes, he has a very French name, if I remember. Rene yeah. Yeah. something yes. or other. Yes, Rene something or other. Yeah. That's who Sardu reminded me of. Yeah, uh, yeah, I could see it. I, I, I thought he was perfectly casted, and he, he, he perfectly hammed it up. Yeah, which was exactly what this movie, and and he is also my impression of people like this. You know, yeah, it's like ooh, because if you put them in any other social setting, they're a creep. They're just a creep. Yeah. If you had to spot the creep and Sardu was standing there, you'd pick him out. I just came up with the greatest theory in the world. Hit me. Heath Ledger was killed. Okay. 
I went to a lot of different websites that had a lot of different reviews about this film. And every single website mentioned something. I didn't even write on the notes that uh, one thing that, that adds to the mystery and the mystique of this film is that two different people who starred in the film died of mysterious circumstances after the film. Yeah. The guy who played Sardu was like stabbed in a robbery immediately after making the film. Mm-hmm. And some other guy died of like he was shot or run over or something after making the film. No, and the, so the ballerina. At, oh, was, was that it? The one who played the ballerina was shot in a hunting accident. There you go. Yeah. 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 So that added to like the spooky mystique of the film. Kind of like how um when you see Manos, the hands of fate. Yeah, this is a shitty movie. But yeah. then you see Torgo and you realize, oh, he killed himself like literally seconds after making the film. And that yeah. adds to kind of the spookiness of it. So what if there is a secret organization of people in Hollywood whose specific job is to save films by making sure that actors disappear? Heath Ledger was killed <laughs> to save Batman! I I believe Randy Quaid said that. Really? It's amazing. Yeah. It, no wonder he's now like crazy and insane because Hollywood wanted him to seem that way. Mm-hmm. Once again, you're getting it here on the Pope on film. That's right. Once again. Which means within three days of the recording... Uh, yep. A, an article about this will pop up on Facebook. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. So Sardu is all, ooh, look at this show, but that's totally what it is. Just a show. Theater. We're doing theater. But then there's a douchebag critic at the show who refuses to review the show he's at. Yes. He's already at the show. Yeah. But he refuses to review it. Even though he's already there because the show isn't as good as the Grand Guignol in mm -hmm. Paris, he is 100% the only Phoenix, Arizona theater reviewer from the Arizona Republic newspaper. <laughs> yes. Throughout the 90s and 2000s, it was absolutely impossible for any theater production to get a good review <laughs> at all. Because this guy was like, oh, a theater company did this play. Of course, it wasn't as good as the original in New York. So let me shit all over everyone. He was a notoriously angry critic who hated everything. Yes. And he was just so horrible. And so when I heard like it, on my Facebook page, they're like, oh, this notorious Arizona theater critic died. I'm like, oh, notorious. So it must be that guy who hated everything. I was so shocked when I went from Phoenix, Arizona to Sacramento and the theater reviewer there was, hey, guess what? They're doing a play. <laughs> a play. You want to know what it's about? It doesn't matter. They're doing a play. <laughs> and we should support all theater. I give it 23 stars out of five. <laughs> so, yeah, basically the critic in this movie who has a name so ridiculously stupid that I immediately forgot it. So don't remind me what his name is because okay. it was stupid. Yes, it was. So the douchebaggy critic um, is from Arizona, basically from the 90s and 2000s. So Sardu is like, oh, so you think this all is fake and stupid. But what if I tell you it was real? Yeah. Like, apparently, you, you, you Sardu, I'm assuming, is bad at poker. Yes. <laughs> I'm assuming. Oh, I don't have any good cards. It's like, oh, well, in that case, I'll forget you. Oh, but what if I'm lying? <laughs> and I do have good cards. Mm -hmm. So Sardu plans a new torture show that will feature the critic. And basically, 
that is the entire plot of the film. Yeah. It's slim on purpose because porn, especially 70s porn, the, the plot was just existed to combine one sex scene with another. Basically, this is the same thing. People paid good money to see this film, to see Sardu and an Afro minion torture and kill women. They uh-huh. didn't come for a s- sensational plot full of twists and turns. Okay? No. They didn't come for a shocking, amazing plot. We so, came for the mannequin feet. Yeah. Uh-huh. So the Arizona Republic theater critic, who, by the way, was also the butler from Trading Places. Really? Yeah. I was blown away that anyone in this film went on to bigger and better things. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, he was I I, di- I didn't even look because I brought it up in IMDb and like, yeah, oh, like maybe two of the actors had a picture. Yeah, I looked up this movie on IMDb and IMDb actually just gave me a blank page that said, "Are you sure?" <laughs> and then it said yes or no, and then I clicked yes, and they said you probably meant no and just sent me to the page for suicide squad. Yes. So I didn't even get to the page. Since since you brought it up and there is definitely comparisons between this movie and Manos, the hands of fate, how much better would Manos, the hands of fate be if Seamus O'Brien was the master? Oh no, that would be amazing. And I would like to take this time to say out loud and record it on a podcast that numerous times in our relationship, Natasha has promised to make me a master's robe from Manos, the Hands of Fate, and she never has. (laughs) That would be every Halloween. Yes. No, I, I think the reason why she hasn't made me the master's robe is that literally she would be asleep and I'd just be standing over her on the bed. Arise, my wife. <laughs> Give me it to the words of Manos. God damn it. Again, honey. Arise, my wife. Take heed the will of Manos. <laughs> that literally I would just never take it off. Yeah. I'd be like, hey, honey. It's like, oh, hi. I see you're still in the master's robe. Yes, because I am the master. (laughs) So the Arizona Republic theater critic is kidnapped and he's brought to Sardu's torture dungeon. Mm -hmm. There's a pointless scene with a naked woman in nipple clamps and electro tit therapy. Well, it it was hardly pointless. My God, you cannot gloss over this. Yeah, no, it really tied the room together. Yeah. So yeah. now So so he he is Sardu is able to get women under his power by shocking them like two or three times. Yeah. Yeah. That's how easy it and, is. And that's it. Then it's all master, master, yeah. 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 Honey. Can I shock your boobs? She didn't answer. I'm taking that as a yes. Sardu knows nothing at all about the Helsinki syndrome. True. Mm -hmm. So now Sardu is planning a new show that will feature uh, his violence combined with ballet because yada, 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 monologuing. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's later showed shown that Sardu uh, sells the women he doesn't kill into the sex trade. So, okay, that's the thing. Um, So there's more characters that are shown throughout the film. There's Tom, the brave football player and boyfriend of the ballerina. Yes. Uh, There's also a corrupt cop thrown into the mix. Also, Sardu has a cage in the basement full of naked Role women that's important. Gee, I wonder if that will come into play later in the film. Yeah. Also, Sardu Sardu keeps his money in a panel in the ground in the angry feral women pit. Yes. 
Mm-hmm. Like what? You couldn't afford a safe? That's the worst place to hide your money is in your pit of feral women. And if you were going to pop for actors at any point in this movie, I mean, I realize that's a ridiculous concept for this movie to begin with, but it should have been the cage of feral women. Yeah. Because the cage of feral women was just laughably stupid. Every yeah, time it yeah. was on the screen, it was like, that is... And there's also a number of scenes in the movie where it seems like the cage is not in any way locked. Yes. Mm-hmm. So that was also a bit of... Like, I'm pretty sure you women can get out. Have you tried pushing instead of pulling the gate? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sorry. Sure. I'm sorry. Naked feral women do not go go dance. There was no, definitely go go no, dancing not. going on in that cage. Yeah. I thought the Batusi was a bit much. Yes. Yes, it but was I a little. Like, yeah. But since you bring up the Batusi, how yes. much do you really have to change of this movie? To make Saur do a Batman villain. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. There's not too much. Like, honestly, it, once you mention that, I picture Saur in, like, Egyptian robes. Yes. hmm And, yeah, no, that would work. That would really work. hmm So, um... Yeah, not sure why Saur keeps his money in the pit, but apparently that's what he does. Then... In the worst lit locker room ever, mm-hmm. the Afro minion kidnaps the ballerina. Like, literally, there would be more light in this locker room. Why is there no light in this locker room? I know <laughs> I shouldn't be nitpicking, mm-hmm. but there would be more light in a locker room. Also, usually well, locker rooms have more than five lockers. Mm-hmm. Usually there's a whole row of them. If if you turned on the lights while filming this scene, it would just alert security and you would get thrown out. Ah, uh, there you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the Afro minion kidnaps the ballerina and there's torture. Then there's probably as far far as i can tell from all the different websites i went to there's probably one of the most well-known scenes with a blonde girl and a doctor bunny yes can you do us can you do me a solid and describe the scene between the blonde girl and the doctor it wasn't too terribly much different from the dentist in in little shop of horrors he was a deranged doctor who always wanted to be a dentist um who ripped out all of these, all of this, all of the, this girl, there was this girl. She had teeth. He pulled them all out. Uh, none of which you see. So just more fake, fake gore. That, that that's what I love about the, it's also fake. It's also badly. Fake. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And then after getting her teeth out, it is implied that, that he gets a blow job from her which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, Then he decides that he is going to do a brain operation, drills a hole in her head. um, And this is one of my favorite scenes in the movie. And then sticks a straw in it and starts drinking her skull through a straw. And he was just so over the top and ridiculous that he... He was funny. He was funny in the same way as that scene is funny in Little Shop of Horrors. Yeah. But it's definitely a and direct he, rip. Yeah. And that doctor drinking the contents of the brain invented the first Slurpee machine. Yes. That is true. Mm-hmm. Then the doctor is killed when he's sent into the cage with all the naked feral women. Mm-hmm. It, most ridiculous a scene. Yeah. And uh, how appar- the, yeah. Apparently, apparently, it's really easy to pull a guy's heart out of his body. Yeah. 
and, and then and, just and, rub it on your naked body. How stupid do you have to be? I mean, it's like a four by four cage. You can see it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, yeah. I don't care what the Afro minion told you. It's and, not and, a quicker and, way. And like eight women with no equipment, with no saws, with just their fingers, yeah. are able to dig into a man's chest and pull out his heart. Yes. And, and then, then rub it on their naked body. Yeah, and play with it like in a Herschel Gordon Lewis movie. Yeah, yeah. Just play with the guts for a while. Yeah. And then, like, immediately after that scene is, like, the human dartboard scene with a nude woman yes, uh, being used as a, a dartboard. So the football guy goes to a crooked cop mm-hmm. who uh, apparently is played by Jay Sherman from TV's The Critic. <laughs> yes. So John Lovitz as the crooked cop. And the crooked cop won't even begin looking for the ballerina unless the football player pays the corrupt cop Mm -hmm. and he wants ten thousand dollars in the 1970s jesus christ you couldn't make this movie for half of that Mm -hmm. for christ's sake so sardu is trying to break the ballerina into performing in his big show so he shows her a woman being killed by getting placed i had a hard time describing this Getting placed on two wooden planks in an X shape. Yes. Then the X is widened until the woman's body is broken. This movie, this is true. You're not going to believe this. This movie is lit so darkly that mid film, Ben Affleck shows up in a Batman suit and starts shooting people. <laughs> That's how badly lit this film is. Well, this film is so badly lit that Superman shows up and makes out with Lois Lane on the corpse of an alien. You, you're trying to cover up all the things that you don't want people to see, like how they keep cranking this cross and the cross is not really moving. And then yeah. they get a close up on the cranks themselves and the chain's not moving either, which makes yeah. sense with the cross not moving. And you're yeah. just like, yeah, they're not, they're not doing anything at all here. Yeah. Not at all. Mm-hmm. Not at all. So then the set, they, they do a second demonstration to get the ballerina to dance. This time, a woman's head is... A, a, a woman is caned on her bare ass, and then the woman's head is cut off. And then that's when you realize that Sardu and the Afro minion are magical. Because the woman's head is cut off and is magically turned into a mannequin's head. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that's when you realize, oh my god, there's these guys are magic. Mm-hmm. The reason why the football player and the corrupt cop are trying to stop them, they're muggles. Yes. They don't understand the magical world that they come from. <laughs> this movie was... was really, really spooky stuff. A, a, a lot of a, a lot of mannequins died in the production of this film. Oh, so many mannequins! Yeah, yeah. they were this mannequin, summer. mannequin heads, yeah. mannequin hands, mannequin feet. Uh, and going back to the mannequin hand, when when he was trying to show how real this all was, and they handcuffed the woman to the table, and Afro minion hacksawed her hand off. Yeah. Yeah. Why was her was the rest of her arm still in the cuff? I do not know. I do not know. She just kept it there. So many mannequins died in the making of this film that I honestly think mm-hmm. that this film would seem better if you added to it the theme to the movie Mannequin. Yes which we talked about in the episode where we played a playlist that featured the theme to the movie Mannequin lip-synced in the movie The Skeleton Twins. Yes. All 
I'm saying is the torture of this film would be so much better if you just put it in slow mo and then add over that. And we can build this dream together, standing <laughs> strong forever. Nothing's gonna stop us now. And then you see like the human dartboard. Yeah. And the woman on X. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nothing's <laughs> gonna stop us now. Whoa, whoa. I'm 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 working this in my mind, and in my mind, this is perfect. Well, I, I'm just thinking that it's really lucky that Kim Cattrall was able to escape to a department store from this movie. Kim Cattrall. Yeah. God, I hated those sex. The whole Sex in the City thing. Yeah. God. Um. So. Oh, I was gonna make a joke, but now I'm not feeling it. Okay. I'm not really feeling it now. Like there was a flow, and I feel the flow was cut off. Yeah. With our talk of Kim Cattrall and whatnot, but I'm gonna say the joke anyway. This summer, you will believe a midget can get a blowjob from a head that was cut off. See, I I forgot the name. Severed head. I got the word. Severed head. See, see, mm-hmm. the joke was gone. The joke was gone. I should have just left it. <laughs> so, yada, yada, yada. There's a bunch of torture scenes. Sardu and his pals are getting ready for the floor show. Yes. The football player and the corrupt cop go to save the ballerina, but now she's drinking the fucking Kool Aid. And he's 100% a servant of Sardu, which which uh, comes into play at the end of the film. Well, so, because because Sardu cut off her rival ballerina's mannequin feet. Yes, yes, mm-hmm. yes. Forgot about that. So, yay, sadism! <laughs> Could also be a good name for this film. Yes. Like, you know, like when they make those films that play on PBS all the time and they're just a compilation of musical numbers and it's that's entertainment. Like this <laughs> film could just be that's sadism. Mm-hmm. Like that would actually work. It probably is a better title than what uh, Sardu, the torture of whatever the hell. Yeah. Still. The crooked cop and the football guy don't buy it. So the cop goes to see Sardu and actually says, Capiche? Yes, he did, damn it. He said, Capiche? Now, the reason why, like, I think that Heath Ledger as the Joker, like, that's an amazing role, and he does a great job, and he got an Oscar for it, and he deserved it. But you know what? The rest of the film did not get an Oscar. And the reason why I think is because literally every like crime boss villain in this film is literally literally throughout the entire film going, hey, now I know why this guy's called the Joker, eh? <laughs> hey, you see these guys? These guys, they be crazy. <laughs> I'm a... I'm, I'm a bad guy criminal, so of course, I's be talking like this. <laughs> These guys, they's don't know respect. I'm a bad guy in this Batman film. <laughs> These guys. Yeah. So that reminded me of Batman, because the corrupt cops is capiche, and that's just, oh, that's gold. That's gold, pony boy. <laughs> so the corrupt cop bribes Sardu for one hundred thousand dollars. So then, finally, yada yada yada, they did, they they do all, they do they practice, and then finally, it's the day of the show, y'all. Yes. So the cop it gets was his great payday, when and then it all began. Them. I was a regular Frankie yeah. fan. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so the cop gets his payday and then and only then does he tell the football player the truth it's like hey 
Now that I got my $100,000, now I should probably tell you that your girlfriend is being held captive by this sadistic guy who's selling uh, women into white slavery. Yeah. So, um, the the show happens, and during the show, uh, and what I think, like, there's a lot of unbelievable parts to this film. Oh, yeah. Just uh, to let you know. Are there believable parts? <laughs> FYI. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, there are believable parts. Like when Sardu is having gay sex with a men's corpse. That's believable. Yes, true. It's probably the most believable part of the film. <laughs> like all these naked women doing what he wants to say. Like, oh, I don't believe that for a goddamn second. But Sardu having gay sex with a man's corpse. Now there you go. <laughs> That's more in line with what I thought about Sardu. Yes. <laughs> now I get you. Now I get you, Phil. But but uh, there's a there's a lot of things that that are kind of unbelievable. But what I thought was the most unbelievable was the scene during the floor show where a topless ballerina jump kicks the critic to death. Yes. In what I'm sure was a beautiful seeming scene when a screenwriter wrote it on a t- typewriter. Mm-hmm. I'm sure in that screenwriter's head, that looked beautiful. Yes, but they had also had several mushrooms. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. But but the peyote obviously wore off when they started filming the scene of the ballerina kicking the theater critic to death. Yes. Yeah. It just didn't seem the same. Hi, honey. How you doing? You want to work on your uh, speech? Well, I'm trying to work on my speech, but okay. your little one Emerald? is very disruptive. Oh, Eleanor. She's been, she's been, um, like she's, going through she's been a fuss budget all day. I'm just trying to, to read my speech and, and work out the kinks so that I, I, cause I'm the first person I've got fucking 8 a.m. tomorrow. I've got to deliver the speech. There's a five minute yep. minimum. So I'm trying to time myself, but it's difficult to time yourself when you have to stop and take care of a child. Yeah. Who's just screaming nonstop. Well, she's not screaming in there. She's just being a little shit. Yeah. I mean, like that. Yeah, true. One thing I learned from one of my speech classes, you should probably start off with the phrase "Wu Tang Clan ain't nothing to fuck with." I think that that is really appropriate for this speech about transgender youth in America. Well, uh, Wu Tang has got all genders covered under Wu Tang Financial. Eleanor can survive five minutes in the dryer. She's waving at you. She's waving at you. That's that's all I'm saying here. You know, kids are resilient. Yeah, she would survive as long as we put a dryer sheet to make sure she doesn't cling to things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's called science, honey. <laughs> that's called science. So we're we're almost done with the torture porn. So that's good. Um. So yeah. A topless ballerina jump kicks a theater critic to death. Yes. And here, here's the worst part about that. Boo, I've seen that before. It's called Cirque du Soleil. <laughs> it's called Cirque du Soleil topless theater critic. It was a specific show that played in, in Reno. And, and it's art, damn it. Reno. Yeah, Reno, Oregon. So there's the big finale. The football player and the cop go backstage to save everyone. Then they beat up a woman or two because it's the 70s. Yes. Yeah. And they just can, you know? Mm-hmm. Like Stone Cold Steve Austin wrestling Lita. Yes. And Stone Cold goes, I'm only going to be able to punch you in the face for about three more years. So, whack! <laughs> I won't be able to do this in the future. Basically, that's this scene. So they're like, we need to save these women by punching them in the face and the <laughs> ovaries. Yes. So there's some good ovary punching, which is good. Every movie needs some good ovary punching. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. 
So they beat up a woman or two. They save the ballerina. They beat up the Afro minion. And they find Sardu literally fucking the critic's dead body. Yes. Like you do. Okay, I need to watch this film. Like you you do if the whim takes you. Yeah. Sometimes a man just needs to fuck another man's dead body. Yes. It's just a part of life. It's called the circle of life. To experience... Hmm? A man lives, a man dies, and then another man fucks the corpse. It's just called the circle of life. A what very. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold okay. on, hold on. Tasha just uh, literally uh, uh, pranced, in, pranced here. in here. What, what, what <laughs> were you going to say? Let's talk about Supernatural. Oh, wow. There's a tie to Supernatural? That's no, amazing. not really. It's a fan and canon. Fan and, fan and tie. Fan and canon? Fan and tie, not canon and tie. Because a lot of people, they're like, well, he was dead. So technically, that's necrophilia. No, that's that's seriously pe- some of people's um, excuse why it's disgusting for Dean to be with Cass. However, Dean's been dead more than Cass. So, right? <laughs> so whoever fucks them apparently is in necrophilia. Just you wanted to, Misha Collins isn't supernatural, so we're trying. I'm trying to work Misha into every episode. You're not getting 10 percent on all of your purchases. It's, I just want to say it's you're n- paying full price for everything. I will pay full price for Misha. Okay, it's that's, not that's an amazing sentence. It's not necrophilia uh, until the body goes cold. Okay, right. Just saying. It's like, but Dean was in. So just to be fair, necrophilia is not illegal. In Phoenix, yes, it's hot. It's hot in Phoenix. Good luck keeping a body cold. It's like 135 freaking degrees. I'm just saying, there's no way a body's getting cold there. A wise man once <laughs> said that to truly know life, one must fuck death. Yeah, in the yeah. gallbladder. Yeah. You know what? I believe Nelson Mandela came up with that in prison. He might have. He might have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Nelson Mandela like run a whole charity out of prison. Yeah, and and he fucked death. He fucked death. So, so the football player and the cop they're going backstage. We're gonna save everyone by beating up chick. Yep. They save the ballerina. They throw the minion through an, a pre broken wall, which is good. You need a pre broken wall to throw a midget in. And it was because so. Because there are no midgets here to throw it in, honey. Eleanor is about the size of a Eleanor midget. is about the size of a midget. We need a pre broken wall to throw Eleanor get through. I'll, I, I, I'll, I'll get the scientists working on the tube technology oh. right away. And when chop, you chop. when you need to create your pre hold wall, okay? Yeah. Don't leave it in that's up to my the... favorite that's my favorite Chris Cornell song. <laughs> pre hold wall. <laughs> won't you come? Don't leave it up to the rise of musicians killing themselves in two thousand seventeen. Don't leave it up to the hippie chick who's just been hanging around all time. Yes. You know, because cause wasn't the shape of the pre-cut hole in the wall was like a psychedelic flower or something. Yeah, it was it was like a it was like Nickelodeon shape. Yes. It was in the shape of slime. No no sharp edges yeah. or anything like that. Just Nice yeah. curvy lines. Sardu presents the Teen Choice Awards. <laughs> yeah. Featuring Afro Minion. Mm-hmm. Justin Timberlake. Yeah. <laughs> That's what that felt like. Yeah. So they're beating up the minion. They find Sardu literally fucking the critic's dead body. So they rough him up, and it looks like a happy ending. One great thing I can give. For this film, it looks like a happy ending. Well, yes. well, 
We saved everyone. We beat up the bad guy. Looks like we can wrap up this film. Until the crooked cop finds the cage full of mm-hmm. feral women. And he's like, hey, naked 70s hairy women. Uh, uh, what's that uh, fake floor there? As everyone knows, you keep your money in a fake floor in a cage full of angry, feral women. Yeah, so Forbes, he, Forbes he, did an article on that once. Yeah, no, no, I read that. That was an amazing article. Um, so he opens the cage full of angry, feral women to get the money. And, of course, the angry, feral women start killing pretty much everyone. Yes. One website said that everyone with a name is then killed by the angry, feral women, which makes this movie seem like the ending is uh, uh, Night of the Living Dead. But let's not forget that everyone is killed except for football guy. He, uh, oh, Eleanor just spilled stuff on me and my phone. I did not know that that drink still had stuff in it. And now you can get drunk by licking my arm <laughs> for a limited time. Yes, get me something. Get me a get me a switch. You're not gonna feed our child. No, I, I, I was I was thinking of the movie switch. Or were you thinking of the Wii switch? The Wii switch? Or the Nintendo Switch. Oh, the Nintendo Switch. Well we can switch if you want. You we can do a freaky Friday thing. Nah. You know, we can Touch our fingers at the same time and be like, oh, you couldn't handle being Steve. Um, excuse me? You couldn't handle being Natasha. And then we touch the tips of our fingers at the same time. Next thing you know, I am in your body. And just to let you know, I'm just going to be masturbating. <laughs> That's all I'm doing. That's all I'm doing. If um, we Freaky okay, Friday, well, I just want you to know the bedroom's going to be locked for about three days. I just want you to know. I'll be gone for those three days. <clears throat> what will you be doing? Probably getting a haircut first. <gasps> oh, dear. This hair. <laughs> I cannot believe you. And then I'd go bang all the dudes I could bang. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, we should go on grinder. Because I want a penis. Yep. So bad. Oh, penises are great. Exactly. <laughs> hey. Like, could you imagine? And since I'm attracted to dudes, well, yeah. honey, we're going to have some gay sex in your body. Sweet. Nice. <laughs> I already know some guys. Cool. That'll probably <laughs> be able to help you out with well, that. Well, I mean, you just give me a phone. So, so, basically, the corrupt cop opens the cage with the naked, feral women, yes. and they kill everyone except for the football guy. The football guy is killed by the ballerina because the ballerina is still brainwashed by Sardu. So the ballerina kills her boyfriend, the football player, in the most amazing way. It's so incredible. Once again, magic comes into play in this film because the ballerina pretends to hit him in the back of the head and then he spits out blood and immediately dies. Yes. It's amazing. I don't know how she does this. I'm assuming she's a wizard. <laughs> and I haven't seen Black Swan, but I'm pretty sure that's how they do it. Yeah, I haven't seen Black Swan either, but I'm pretty sure it's 90% this film. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yes. Yeah, so the the ballerina kills the Facebook. It kills the football player. <laughs> I wish I, no, the no, kills no, Facebook. no, for football, I just write FB over and over again on this page, so I just got confused with FB. So the ballerina kills football player. <laughs> yes. And not Facebook. <laughs> and the movie literally ends with a feral woman eating a dick sandwich. Yes. Mm-hmm. What? Did she cook it? Did she split it in half? And, and Probably not. I don't even know where she got the buns or the, yeah, the that's, like, lettuce. Or, that was exactly she's my in a cage. question. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe she's been hiding it. This, this angry, feral, murderous woman has been hiding 
a bun, lettuce, and ketchup this entire time. I like the way you think. Boobs can hide a lot. No, none of these women have had big boobs. No. Did they have vaginas? Very hairy vaginas. This Why is, is the, the sandwich soggy? I do not know the squishy quality of, this, of the hot dog bun. Did it look like it might have been a bit uh, wrinkly? I'll no, no, it looked it in. looked very fresh and kind of delicious. Yeah. Well, then maybe your vagina bakes hot dog buns. <laughs> I'm just saying. Quote. <laughs> the most Quote. serious yeast infection in history. Exactly. We gotta do something with all that yeast. <laughs> I want that quote from Natasha to be on a bumper sticker that I can put on my car. <laughs> Quote. Maybe her vagina cooks hot dog buns. <laughs> Natasha Galindo of the Pope on Film bakes, Podcast. Bakes, not cooks. Bakes. Cook. Thank you. Thank you. Gotta, gotta get this straight. 2017. Just to be clear, that's the best ending. Well, you don't know. Yes, uh, to the Pope on Film Podcast. Ever. <laughs> she has an easy bake snatch. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe that's why they compare it to pie. Nice. Um, and, and also. If you are a struggling musician looking for a band name, Easy Bake Snatch, this week's free band name. There you go. Boom. Right there. Easy Bake Snatch. I, I'm i pretty sure I saw them in Tempe at the Mason Jar <laughs> in 98. So there you go. Easy Bake Snatch. Currently on tour. With Ovary Puncher. Yes. So you did not like this film? I liked it for the history aspect of it. I just thought that all of it was ridiculous. It it was, and that's that's why for me it's like a grown up Adams family. Yeah. It's an but Adams family with tits it. and gore. I respected it for what it was. Yeah, and what it was, was the first torture porn ever, and I love the Saw film, so it's like, God damn it! Like I, I can't hate it. Mm -hmm. It was ridiculous and a bit forgettable at times, but like I, did I like it? No, but I respect the shit out of it. Yes, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. It's it, like it, a Vince Vaughn and Ron Burgundy. Yeah. But see, again, for me, all of these kinds of movies were, were sleazy and, and very porn-like. Yeah. You know, so this was just, you know, just one of that type of movie. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to pick it as, as a kind of representation of early video, of early video horror movies. Yeah, that makes sense. That were all pretty much made in somebody's basement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it was, it was good. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I liked it. It it was fun ish. I, but yeah, I, no. I love fake effects. So oh, yeah. I, I like that too. It's like you, yeah. you're twisting that thing on the girl's head and you, you're not doing anything. I could see that you are yeah, not no, doing anything. It, no, literally nothing is moving. Nothing is happening. And we're going to have to do a cutaway so you can add the blood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that was made by... Yeah, that death happened due to Foley work. <laughs> and not from actual murder of any kind. Yes. Yeah. So that is all I have for this week. Do you? Um, I, I'm excited for the end of every episode of this podcast because I really have no idea what's next. Yes, and I'm kind of hoping that I'm going to zig when you think I'm going to zag. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Uh, 
I went looking because because with this, I also like want to challenge myself, you know, okay. see, like after this. There's no real point to go after Last House on the Left or something like that, you know? Yeah. We've seen a, 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 a freaky gore movie. So I, wa I want to try to broaden our horizons with something that has gotten mentioned on the show a little bit, but not really fully explored. I'm going to go with Begotten. Oh, shit. All right, then. I knew eventually we would get there. And we got there. Because I'm trying... We're doing begotten. Uh, I'm trying to find hardcore horror or art movie, you know, because a lot of a lot of art movies fall in that same kind of horror category. Yeah. So begun. Yeah. I, I also found it you, when you first mentioned it. You mentioned that it was on YouTube, and I had found it uh, on YouTube as well. So. Let's cover that. And I have a lot of choices for the third one. I don't know which direction I'm going to go in for that one. Yeah. All right. This is going to be exciting. Next week, and I'm going to try and find a way that these two things um, tie together. Okay. But next week, we are watching Be Cotton, a bizarre, extreme art film where God disembowels herself. Yes. And Mother Nature gets raped. <laughs> and, of course, in a related way, we will be watching a 1990 Blockbusters video training video. Yes. And those two fit in well because... Working at Blockbuster Video is a lot like disemboweling yourself. Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. No, that that that's that's what I just came up with on the top of my head, and that's that's what I'm going with. <laughs> so next week, a bizarre art film and um, Blockbuster Video. That's yes. going to be exciting. Yeah, no, you, you are definitely zigging when I thought you would zag. Yes. That's exciting. I was not expecting that. This is going to be good. <laughs> uh, one, of, one of Complex Magazine's most disturbing films of all time. Yes. Is what we are doing next week. Oh, that's exciting. Oh, man, this is going to be good. <laughs> next week, we got a good episode, guys. We got a good episode. We are we are bringing the crazy next week. Yes, we are. Begotten. Bizarre art film. It's on YouTube. Look for it. It's fucked up. If you don't know what the movie is about, that's great. So you should watch it because it's more disturbing if you don't know what the film is about. <laughs> if you have no idea what the director is going for, then it's more fucked up. So... Watch that. That's going to be amazing. And, um, yeah. So I guess all that's left is to look back on this episode. And well, but, but do we, do we want to do that this next <clears throat> show or do we want to do an Ed Wood, Wood film? Oh shit. For Wood. Yeah. Cause we've got, yeah. Cause we got Woodmas coming up. Um, well, really wouldn't this be the Woodmas episode? Because isn't this coming out on the 9th? Uh, yeah, I guess so. So really, like, if we're going to do an Ed Wood film, we really got to do Bride of the Monster, because we've already done Plan 9. Right. I, the Bride of the Monster is next. But... Mwah, I love you, Eleanor. 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 Eleanor, come here. Come here. Come here. Should we do Bride of the Monster next, or should we do Begotten? What do you think? Tell Bunny. Tell Bunny. Tell Bunny what you think we should do. Tell Bunny. 
What should we do? What should we do? Tell Bunny. I think she said begotten. Pretty sure she said begotten. She 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 said it to me psychically. Well then then let's do that. Let's do this weird art film in tribute to Edward. Yes. Yes. Okay. That works. So that would mean I would need to come up with another movie and I don't think that's gonna be a problem. Okay. Cool. And I've already got a couple of movies lined up on our um, cough cough for for November. Okay. So, like whatever messed up stuff you have planned for October, we're doing the new Spider Man in November. So that's good. Oh, nice. That would make a nice palate cleanser because I wanna I wanna find out how dark this rabbit hole goes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can kind of tell with this week's movie. So, however messed up it is, like, we have Spider-Man and Wonder Woman waiting for us to kind of cleanse all of this off of us. <laughs> yes. So that's good. And I recently watched Spider-Man, the new Spider-Man movie, with Natasha and Maxwell, and they both loved it. And they're oh. really good critics. Like it's difficult. It's difficult to get Natasha to sit down to watch a movie. She will sit down and watch Supernatural for five hours, but she won't watch a movie because it's too long. It's that sort of streaming <laughs> madness that everyone gets. Yes. I don't want to sit down and watch this hour and a half movie, but I will easily watch uh, nine episodes of Thirty Rock. Mm -hmm. So that's just a, a craziness that we have all gotten. But there are. Only two movies that I've been able to get her to watch over the last, like, six months. Spider-Man Homecoming and fucking Baby Driver. <laughs> are the only two movies I got her to sit down to watch. Oh, my God. She had so much work to do. She had so much homework, and it's due tomorrow, and I need to work on this. And today is my day, and I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to work on this. And I said, that's fine, honey. Just do me a favor. Sit down and watch the opening of Baby Driver. <laughs> Two hours later, she was cursing my name mm -hmm. and threatening to kill me. But on the positive side, she loved Baby Driver. <laughs> That's a wonderful movie. That is a wonderful movie. But the best thing about the new Spider-Man movie is it's just... It, I don't know. I, I don't think I've ever seen a Spider-Man movie where he actually seemed young. No, no. I, I mean, I thought Tobey Maguire was was a good choice because he, he, he seemed huh? older. He seemed older. He didn't and seem he older to me, probably because I was just older. Yeah, he seemed older to me, and also he graduates at the like halfway through the first film for shit's sake. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, by the end of the film, he has his own place with Harry Osborn, and he's trying to get a job, and it's like, okay, this is an older Spider-Man. Yeah. And Andrew Garfield is supposedly in high school through the whole thing, but he still seems older, but this Spider-Man actually seems young and he seems like he's in high school and and it's called homecoming because there's a homecoming dance at the end of the film and it really does seem like less of a superhero film and more of like a high school movie like this could be like uh the day my kid went punk i was thinking like a like a 16 candles or like a breakfast club like that uh. sort of a like like who's the guy who did all those movies in the 80s yeah, his name will come What's to me. His name? A... his name escapes me. Um, they were all set in Shermer, Illinois, but there is no Shermer in Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like if they got him to make a superhero movie, it would be Spider-Man Homecoming. Nice. Yeah, it, it's really good. <laughs> anyway, now that anyway. we're at the end of this episode, and we're looking back uh huh. This episode, like, like really thinking, like, with, like the Rick and Morty stuff, I thought was really good, and uh, Toby Hooper, that was surprising. Yes, it was. And, 
And um, Amber Spain, who no doubt is going to get thousands of people to to listen to this episode. Uh-huh. Now that I think about it, and also, oh man, I, I was just waiting for an episode where Amber's boyfriend talked in the background through 60% of it. I was just waiting for that. Yes, it was a highlight. So, yeah, that was a big highlight of the episode. I gotta say, this has been a pretty damn good episode. This has been a good episode. Yeah, it has. I concur. I concur. And the beginning of our horrific journey through yes. October. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, through October. Be sure and, and uh, uh, suck off a black eye for National Chocolate Day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And I am Reverend Steve. And on behalf of Maxwell and Screaming Eleanor and Natasha and the rest of my family, I just want to say thanks for listening. And we will see you next week, you godless heathens. And Bella, because she's amazing. (laughs) Bella is awesome. And she's 12, and she's in seventh grade. And every other Thursday, I have to take her to therapy. Yes. And she she has a therapist. And it's like a half hour we're away and it's like a real pain in the ass to get there yeah but um it's worth it because number one we get into the therapist office and they are almost always playing a disney movie (laughs) on the tv in the waiting room and it becomes like a game and i remember driving to therapy going okay now i'm gonna say Finding Nemo, but I'm gonna guess the Little Mermaid. <laughs> but I was wrong. Today they were playing Ratatouille, but I was oh. close. I was really close. Yeah. And then there's there's all these really uncomfortable seats, and then one giant leather couch. And I always say to to Bella. If the leather couch isn't available, you're not getting therapy. <laughs> God damn it, I need the comfy couch. If I'm going to be sitting there for an hour, God damn it, I want the comfy fucking couch. They're also right next to an outlet, and I can charge my goddamn phone. Mm-hmm. Not to mention the fact that one time Natasha took Bella to therapy, and they were playing a fucking... Uh, 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 um, um, all about Eve? No, not all about what Eve. Happened it, it happened to Jane. to Jane. Yes. And so we did an episode on it, and and that was surprising. It, was it a good episode? I don't know, but it was different, and that's what I'm going for. It was very different. Yes, it was unexpected mm-hmm. for us to do like a Doris Day movie. Yes, <clears throat> but the best part is, is that. Like, we go to therapy, and I so look forward to therapy because it's like, okay, I'm sitting here for an hour and 15 minutes. I have nothing to do but work on the podcast. (laughs) Okay. And Bella comes out, and she goes, oh, I'm done with therapy. And I go, great. I just wrote three pages. Nice. Like, I look forward to therapy. It (laughs) reminds me... It reminds me of that documentary American movie with Mark Borchardt. Yes. He's working on the film Coven. And there's a scene where he wakes up early and goes to the parking lot of an airport. because, And he does most of his writing there because there's nothing else to do but write. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. that's me and taking Bella to therapy, and I so look forward to it because it's like, yeah, yeah, I get to take you to therapy and work on do, and do nothing but work on the podcast. Yes. Basically, what I'm saying is the episodes are better when my daughter has therapy. Uh, I think that could be scientifically proven. Yeah, that can be mm-hmm. scientifically proven. This was a therapy episode, so of course it was better. I came up with the whole Toby Hooper thing. 
while yes. sitting on the comfy leather couch watching <laughs> Ratatouille. Which isn't the best Pixar film, but that's why I like it. Uh, I've only seen it the- once, and it was me. It was okay. It didn't. I've kill seen me. it like I've seen it like a bajillion times, but I never paid attention enough to realize that the angry French woman slash love interest in the film is Janine Garofalo. Really. I have watched that film a million times with that knowledge in my mind, and I still cannot in any way hear her. (laughs) So apparently, she is the greatest voiceover actress in the world. That could be. Because I know Janine Garofalo's voice, for shit's sake. I used to love watching the Ben Stiller show, which just shows my age. (laughs) Because when was the last time anyone cared about him? But God damn it, I can't hear Janine Garofalo. And when I came to therapy and I saw Ratatouille was on, I said, okay, I'm listening for the voice of Janine Garofalo. And I just, I can't hear it. I can't hear it. Apparently, she's the greatest woman ever. <laughs> I, I just can't hear her voice. And it drives me nuts. <laughs> anyway. On behalf of, of Bella, yes, and Natasha and Amber and Amber's boyfriend, whose name doesn't matter, <laughs> I just want to say thanks for listening, and we will see you next week, you godless heathens. Do 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 do